Chapter 2 Mr. Bennet was among the earliest of those who waited on Mr. Bingley. He had always intended to visit him, though to the last always assuring his wife that he should not go, and till the evening after the visit was paid she had no knowledge of it. It was then disclosed in the following manner. Observing his second daughter employed in trimming a hat, he suddenly addressed her with, "'I hope Mr. Bingley will like it, Lizzie.' "'We are not in a way to know what Mr. Bingley likes,' said her mother resentfully, "'since we are not to visit.' "'But you forget, Mamma," said Elizabeth, "'that we shall meet him at the assemblies, and that Mrs. Long has promised to introduce him.' "'I do not believe Mrs. Long will do any such thing. She has two nieces of her own. She is a selfish, hypocritical woman, and I have no opinion of her.' "'Nor have I,' said Mr. Bennet, "'and I am glad to find that you do not depend on her serving you.' Mrs. Bennet deigned not to make any reply, but, unable to contain herself, began scolding one of her daughters. "'Don't keep coughing so, Kitty, for heaven's sake! Have a little compassion on my nerves! You tear them to pieces!' "'Kitty has no discretion in her coughs,' said her father. "'She times them ill.' "'I do not cough for my own amusement,' replied Kitty fretfully. "'When is your next ball to be, Lizzie?' "'Tomorrow fortnight.' "'Aye, so it is,' cried her mother. "'And Mrs. Long does not come back till the day before, "'so it will be impossible for her to introduce him, "'for she will not know him herself.' "'Then, my dear, you may have the advantage of your friend "'and introduce Mr. Bingley to her.' "'Impossible, Mr. Bennet, impossible! "'When I am not acquainted with him myself, "'how can you be so teasing?' "'I honour your circumspection. "'A fortnight's acquaintance is certainly very little. "'One cannot know what a man really is by the end of a fortnight.' But if we do not venture, somebody else will, and after all, Mrs. Long and her nieces must stand their chance, and therefore she will think it an act of kindness. If you decline the office, I will take it on myself. The girls stared at their father. Mrs. Bennet said only, Nonsense! Nonsense! What can be the meaning of that emphatic exclamation? cried he. Do you not consider the forms of introduction and the stress that is laid on them as nonsense? I cannot quite agree with you there. "'What say you, Mary? "'For you are a young lady of deep reflection, I know, "'and read great books and make great extracts.' "'Mary wished to say something very sensible, "'but knew not how. "'While Mary is adjusting her ideas,' he continued, "'let us return to Mr. Bingley.' "'I am sick of Mr. Bingley!' cried his wife. "'I am sorry to hear that. "'But why did not you tell me so before? "'If I had known as much this morning, "'I certainly would not have called on him.' It is very unlucky, but as if I have actually paid the visit, we cannot escape the acquaintance now. The astonishment of the ladies was just what he wished, that of Mrs. Bennet perhaps surpassing the rest, though when the first tumult of joy was over, she began to declare that it was what she had expected all the while. How good it was in you, my dear Mr. Bennet, but I knew I should persuade you at last. I was sure you loved your girls too well to neglect such an acquaintance. Well, how pleased I am, and it is such a good joke, too, that you should have gone this morning and never said a word about it till now. Now, Kitty, you may cough as much as you choose, said Mr. Bennet, and as he spoke he left the room, fatigued with the raptures of his wife. What an excellent father you have, girls, said she, when the door was shut. I do not know how you will ever make him amends for his kindness, or me either, for that matter. At our time of life it is not so pleasant, I can tell you, to be making new acquaintance every day. But for your sakes we would do anything. Lydia, my love, though you are the youngest, I dare say Mr. Bingley will dance with you at the next ball. Oh, said Lydia stoutly, I am not afraid, for though I am the youngest, I am the tallest. The rest of the evening was spent in conjecturing how soon he would return Mr. Bennet's visit and determining when they should ask him to dinner. Chapter 3 Not all that Mrs. Bennet, however, with the assistance of her five daughters, could ask on the subject was sufficient to draw from her husband any satisfactory description of Mr. Bingley. They attacked him in various ways, with barefaced questions, ingenious suppositions, and distant surmises, but he eluded the skill of them all and they were at last obliged to accept the second-hand intelligence of their neighbor, Lady Lucas. Her report was highly favorable. Sir William had been delighted with him. He was quite young, wonderfully handsome, extremely agreeable, and to crown the whole, he meant to be at the next assembly with a large party. Nothing could be more delightful. To be fond of dancing was a certain step towards falling in love, and very lively hopes of Mr. Bingley's heart were entertained. 
If I can but see one of my daughters happily settled at Netherfield, said Mrs. Bennet to her husband, and all the others equally well married, I shall have nothing to wish for. In a few days, Mr. Bingley returned Mr. Bennet's visit, and sat about ten minutes with him in his library. He had entertained hopes of being admitted to a sight of the young ladies, of whose beauty he had heard much, but he saw only the father. The ladies were somewhat more fortunate, for they had the advantage of ascertaining from an upper window that he wore a blue coat and rode a black horse. An invitation to dinner was soon afterwards dispatched, and already had Mrs. Bennet planned the courses that were to do credit to her housekeeping, when an answer arrived which deferred it all. Mr. Bingley was obliged to be in town the following day, and consequently unable to accept the honor of their invitation, etc. Mrs. Bennet was quite disconcerted. She could not imagine what business he could have in town so soon after his arrival in Hertfordshire, and she began to fear that he might be always flying about from one place to another, and never settled in another field as he ought to be. Lady Lucas quieted her fears a little by starting the idea of his being gone to London only to get a large party for the ball, and a report soon followed that Mr. Bingley was to bring twelve ladies and seven gentlemen with him to the assembly. The girls grieved over such a number of ladies, but were comforted the day before the ball by hearing that, instead of twelve, he had brought only six with him from London, his five sisters and a cousin, and when the party entered the assembly room, it consisted of only five altogether. Mr. Bingley, his two sisters, the husband of the eldest, and another young man. Mr. Bingley was good-looking and gentlemanlike. He had a pleasant countenance and easy, unaffected manners. His sisters were fine women, with an air of decided fashion. His brother-in-law, Mr. Hurst, merely looked the gentleman, but his friend, Mr. Darcy, soon drew the attention of the room by his fine, tall person, handsome features, noble mien, and the report, which was in general circulation within five minutes after his entrance, of his having ten thousand a year. The gentleman pronounced him to be a fine figure of a man. The ladies declared he was much handsomer than Mr. Bingley, and he was looked at with great admiration for about half the evening, till his manners gave a disgust which turned the tide of his popularity, for he was discovered to be proud, to be above his company, and above being pleased, and not all his large estate in Derbyshire could then save him from having a most forbidding, disagreeable countenance, and being unworthy to be compared to his friend. Mr. Bingley had soon made himself acquainted with all the principal people in the room. He was lively and unreserved, danced every dance, was angry that the ball closed so early, and talked of giving one himself at Netherfield. Such amiable qualities must speak for themselves. What a contrast between him and his friend! Mr. Darcy danced only once with Mrs. Hurst, and once with Miss Bingley, declined being introduced to any other lady, and spent the rest of the evening in walking about the room, speaking occasionally to one of his own party. His character was decided. He was the proudest, most disagreeable man in the world, and everybody hoped that he would never come there again. Amongst the most violent against him was Mrs. Bennet, whose dislike of his general behavior was sharpened into particular resentment by his having slighted one of her daughters. Elizabeth Bennet had been obliged by the scarcity of gentlemen to sit down for two dances, and during part of that time Mr. Darcy had been standing near enough for her to overhear a conversation between him and Mr. Bingley, who came from the dance for a few minutes to press his friend to join it. "'Come, Darcy,' said he, "'I must have you dance. "'I hate to see you standing about by yourself in this stupid manner. "'You had much better dance.' "'I certainly shall not. "'You know how I detest it, "'unless I am particularly acquainted with my partner. "'At such an assembly as this it would be insupportable. "'Your sisters are engaged, and there is not another woman in the room "'whom it would not be a punishment for me to stand up with.' "'I would not be so fastidious as you are,' cried Bingley, "'for a kingdom!' Upon my honour, I never met with so many pleasant girls in my life as I have this evening, and there are several of them you see uncommonly pretty. You are dancing with the only handsome girl in the room, said Mr. Darcy, looking at the eldest Miss Bennet. Oh, she is the most beautiful creature I ever beheld. But there is one of her sisters sitting down just behind you, who is very pretty and I dare say very agreeable. Do let me ask my partner to introduce you. Which do you mean? and turning around, he looked for a moment at Elizabeth, till catching her eye, he withdrew his own and coldly said, She is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me. 
and I am in no humour at present to give consequence to young ladies who are slighted by other men. You had better return to your partner and enjoy her smiles, for you are wasting your time with me. Mr. Bingley followed his advice. Mr. Darcy walked off, and Elizabeth remained with no very cordial feelings towards him. She told the story, however, with great spirit among her friends, for she had a lively, playful disposition, which delighted in anything ridiculous. The evening altogether passed off pleasantly to the whole family. Mrs. Bennet had seen her eldest daughter much admired by the Netherfield party. Mr. Bingley had danced with her twice, and she had been distinguished by his sisters. Jane was as much gratified by this as her mother could be, though in a quieter way. Elizabeth felt Jane's pleasure. Mary had heard herself mention to Miss Bingley as the most accomplished girl in the neighborhood, and Catherine and Lydia had been fortunate enough to be never without partners, which was all that they had yet learnt to care for at a ball. They returned, therefore, in good spirits to Longbourn, the village where they lived, and of which they were the principal inhabitants. They found Mr. Bennet still up. With the book, he was regardless of time, and on the present occasion he had a good deal of curiosity as to the event of an evening which had raised such splendid expectations. He had rather hoped that all his wife's views on the stranger would be disappointed, but he soon found that he had a very different story to hear. "'Oh, my dear Mr. Bennet,' as she entered the room, "'we have had the most delightful evening, a most excellent ball. I wish you had been there. Jane was so admired. Nothing could be like it. Everybody said how well she looked, and Mr. Bingley thought her quite beautiful and danced with her twice.' Only think of that, my dear. He actually danced with her twice, and she was the only creature in the room that he asked a second time. First of all, he asked Miss Lucas. I was so vexed to see him stand up with her, but, however, he did not admire her at all. Indeed, nobody can, you know. And he seemed quite struck with Jane as she was going down the dance. So he inquired who she was, and got introduced, and asked her for the two next. Then the two-third he danced with Miss King, and the two-fourth with Maria Lucas, and two-fifth with Jane again, and the two-sixth with Lizzie, and the Boulanger. If he had had any compassion for me cried her husband impatiently. He would not have danced half so much. For God's sake, say no more of his partners. Oh, that he had sprained his ankle in the first dance. Oh, my dear, continued Mrs. Bennet, I am quite delighted with him. He is so excessively handsome, and his sisters are charming women. I never in my life saw anything more elegant than their dresses. I dare say the lace upon Mrs. Hurst's gown. Here she was interrupted again. Mr. Bennet protested against any description of finery. She was therefore obliged to seek another branch of the subject, and related, with much bitterness of spirit and some exaggeration, the shocking rudeness of Mr. Darcy. But I can assure you, she added, that Lizzie does not lose much by not suiting his fancy, for he is a most disagreeable, horrid man, not at all worth pleasing so high and so conceited that there was no enduring him. He walked here and he walked there, fancying himself so very great, not handsome enough to dance with. I wish you had been there, my dear, to have given him one of your set-downs. I quite detest the man. 